interested in history? Why should we be interested in something which happened in the past? See, on this golden age topic, of course, I think golden age is mostly in our heads. We all like to romanticize things. We all like to build up heroes. We all want to draw inspiration from the past. As I said earlier, people in the past were not living their days thinking, oh, we'll be living in a golden age. That's not how they went about their business. Their own, they had their own challenges and their own problems. But on the broader question of what, why do we need to know history, for the simple reason that history is what, what has made the world what it is today, the stage that we, our society lives on was built by the people who came before. And unless you understand the foundations of that stage, you never know when it's going to collapse, what the state of that stage is, and so on. So, you know, of course, different historians have their own politics. So, you know, there's this example I give of this 1565 Battle of Talikota, where the Vijayanagar Empire, in this book, the second book, the Vijayanagar Empire is destroyed by the Sultanates of the Deccan. And for the longest time, because now religion is so important in politics, and history is a very political subject, uh, you know, it was always positioned as a Hindu versus Muslim battle, where a set of Muslim sultans come and destroy a Hindu empire. Now, as a historian, you find that this is very simplistic. It actually isn't the truth. For the simple reason that at the Battle of Talikota, the Vijayanagar emperor who was leading the charge, who was leading the battle, he began his career in the court of the Qutub Shah of Golconda, who was a Muslim. The Qutub Shah who was at the battle had spent seven years as a teenager living in Vijayanagar, learning Telugu, learning Sanskrit, marrying a local woman. He went back to Golconda, patronized poetry on the Mahabharata. A poet like Shetraya could go to Madurai, he could go to Tanjaur, but he could also come and compose 105,000 padams for the Qutub Shah of Golconda. Uh, there were 6,000 Marathas at the Battle of Talikota, but they were fighting for the Sultans. There was a leading Muslim general called Ainul Mul Gilani. He was fighting for the Vijayanagar emperor. So, this Hindu-Muslim divide that people create is pretty much a... We find it convenient now to box people into these categories, but history was... history. The raw material is there. Different historians have their own politics. They put it into different boxes. But that's not how it functioned, actually, at the time. We need to, therefore, interrogate history to find answers about our own present. What many people do now, especially politicians, and this is politicians across the board, whether it's the extreme leftists, rightists, whoever, History has become a political shuttlecock between various parties just to legitimize themselves, their own ideologies, their own agendas. But that is not what history is meant to do. History exists in its own universe, on its own terms. We can draw inspiration from it, but we should not project our anxieties onto history. We should not seek justification for our uh, weaknesses and problems and insecurities from history and try and invent all kinds of uh, issues that were never there. History is a very complex subject, but it's also a fascinating subject. So in Rebel Sultans, there's a character called Ibrahim Adil Shah II, and he's remarkable for the simple reason that if you look at him from most historians' perspective, he's a Sunni Muslim Sultan. But he's all, he also used to wear a Rudraksha Mala. He also called himself son of Guru Ganapati and Saraswati. He, he, he patronized a lot of Maharashtrian poets. His court was populated by Brahmins and Marathas. His favorite wife was a Maharashtrian. Uh, there's a, on the cover of the book, there's a black gentleman riding on an elephant. I grew up in Maharashtra, and not many people there know that thousands of Africans used to live in that part of India. And that, you know, before Shivaji, for 27 years, keeping the Mughals at bay from the Deccan, was a man called Malikambar, who was born in Ethiopia, was enslaved and taken to Baghdad, came to the Deccan, became a kingmaker, got his equally black daughter married to a king. So we're looking at a black queen in medieval Ahmednagar, early modern Ahmednagar. And this is the man who held the British, uh, the Mughals at bay for a good two and a half decades, to the extent that Emperor Jahangir got so pissed off at Malikambar because he couldn't ever defeat him that he commissioned a painting where he's shooting an arrow at Malikambar's severed head because in real life he could never achieve this. And the irony is Shivaji's grandfather, Maloji, was one of Malikambar's right-hand men. If you go to uh, 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 near the, the Elora Caves, uh, close to that, there's a place where Maloji and Shivaji's grandfather's brothers' samadhis are there, you know, where they died and their cremations were held. These samadhis, if you look at them at one glance, they look like Islamic mausoleums. They look like Islamic monuments with domes and all of that. They're actually samadhis of two staunch Hindu men whose grandson was the famous Shivaji. Even in Shivaji's story, Shivaji's father even briefly worked for the Mughals themselves. When uh, Afzal Khan comes to kill Shivaji, on Shivaji's side, you have Siddhi Ibrahim, who's a Muslim. On Afzal Khan's side, the army, the list of names is things like Gorpade. You know, these are all Maharashtrian Hindu names. Shiva Bharata is a poem that Shivaji himself commissioned, in which Malikambar, this African, there's high praise reserved for him. He's called as brave as the sun and so on. And Shivaji's grandfather and Shivaji's father's pride comes from being close comrades of Malikambar and close comrades of the Nizam Shah. 
The Nizam Shah is a Muslim, but his ancestors were Brahmins. So there are no easy answers. The Adil Shahs of Bijapur, they were founded by a, a man called Yusuf, who got on a ship from, uh, from Persia, came to the Deccan. Somewhere on the way, he decided, I'm going to fabricate a genealogy for me. And he started claiming he was the long-lost son of the Ottoman Sultan. And here he came, and he married a Maratha lady. And that's how the Adil Shahi dynasty was founded. So on the one hand, they're part Persian. But on the other hand, they're also equally part Marathi and part Hindi, Hindu. And therefore, different Adil Shahs of Bijapur had different aspects of their heritage that they highlighted. One would choose the Persian uh, Shia element. The other would choose the Maharashtrian element. Others would like the Sanskritic element. Uh, go to Vijayanagar. You know, if you go to the, 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 the great temple in Tirupati, there is this famous bronze over there of Krishna Devaraya, the famous emperor, with his two wives. This bronze is now covered up in a sari and all that. Look at Krishna Devaraya's hat. He's wearing a Turkish hat. Because even in Vijayanagar, the fashion sense was inf influenced by Persian fashions. The clothes they wore were influenced by Persian clothes. Because, as I said, these people didn't like us today. Politics, power, greed, money, these are what motivated, you know, people's everyday ang ambitions and politics. It wasn't religion. They didn't wake up saying, I'm going to defend religion this morning. Religion was an excuse. Just as today we have nationalism as an excuse. Nyingaka, if you want to do something, find a suitable excuse to legitimize it. Unnit was religion, today it's nationalism. I'm glad um, 